Chris Wakefield. It's good to be here. Now, I would let you bring us into the future, but why don't I just hit all three bios and then come right back to you and you sure. can drag us to the future. Does that sound all right? Me, it's fine, yeah. All right, awesome. So we'll move on to Emily Triggs. Emily Triggs is a bred in the bones roots musician. In her debut album, When Guinevere Went Under, the guitar singer songwriter takes you on a journey through influences and experiences that have shaped her folk roots sound. Pushing the boundaries of what she considers folk and bringing in influences had over the years, she says those influences span the deep south with the likes of Lead Belly through Texas blues, strains from the Appalachian Mountains to her early years in French Canada. A regular performer at family gatherings and parties since she was small enough to fit inside of a guitar case. Emily's natural talent was honed in Hemingford, Quebec. Her mother, Louise Demers Triggs, was a dancer in the folk troupe Le Fofolet. Her father, Stanley Triggs, was a folk singer in the 1960s and has songs that we found within Smithsonian folkways. The youngest of five, growing up in a mix of English and French culture, it was in living room jam sessions with local and visiting musicians that Emily learned the history and art of lyrical composition and performance. By age 11, she was playing guitar, writing songs, and performing. Music was her calling. Emily studied music at Montreal's Dawson College, then headed south to Elkins, West Virginia. There, she studied a minor in music and immersed herself in the Appalachian folk music culture. Calgary was the next stop where she has broken more than a few guitar strings as a solo performer, along with singing as the Sweet Side of the House Doctors or as one of the Seraphs in Magnolia Buckskin. As a writer, her philosophy is simple. Sorry, songwriter, her philosophy is simple. All of life's experiences for better or for worse can be mined for the for the raw materials of a good song hence her mantra of no regrets she is an observer of the world around us i'll hear somebody's story and i'll think man how was that for you i feel for people and it really is a release to be able to let it out through my art she says emily shares stories through her songs with an endearing simplicity and emotional depth with a pure and true vocal complementing a solid base of undeniably roots music composition emily engages the listener her music grips the heart and elevates the soul her songs are double-edged unapologetic and a unique sound in the genre of folk roots. Emily, thank you for joining us this evening. And finally, I will move on to Carl White. And you're going to actually take it from me because you have the smallest biography that I could find about you, though I found lots of material. And then we'll work our way backwards through these biographies and have our uh, guests introduce themselves. So meeting the artists, Carl White, we are pleased to offer a new series. This is a virtual tour with Carl White. This is where I found some biography. Pleased to offer a new series called Meet the Artist. Join the Art Gallery of Grand Prairie's curator, Learning Sabine Schneider, in a conversation with artist Carl White about his exhibition, I Dreamed a Universe, on display at the Art Gallery of Grand Prairie until May 30th, 2021. This um, program was created to be able to visit the Art Gallery in the comfort of homes, classrooms, offices, and locations. After the group has watched the video, you can facilitate the art project in inspired by the artist exhibition with free activity kits. This video reflects unique perspectives related to the exhibition, and they recommend that the facilitators preview the video before sharing it to the audience. Carl White was born in Liverpool, England, 1969. He studied at the, Car the Alberta College of Art and Design from 89 to 92 in Calgary, Alberta. His paintings and drawings have been featured in many solo and group exhibitions across Canada since 1992, and reside in numerous private collections nationally and internationally. What White care, uh, currently lives and works in, uh, in Calgary, Alberta, where he divides his time between teaching and Studio White. I welcome you, Carl White, to our Umbrella Talk this evening, and I'll let you bolster your background for us and the uh, guests who are attending. Thank you so very much. Thanks, brother. Um, yeah, um, that's pretty much it anyway. I mean, um, I was born, I started making art, and here I am. <laughs> um, you know, um, yeah, I've been making art since I could move my hands, you know, it's just kind of what I'm here for. And um, it's really been an ongoing attempt to understand what it is to be a human being. And uh, I'm just in pursuit of that, you know, and um, 
art's been my means of understanding that. Um, I represented by galleries across North America and Europe and I make my living as a full-time artist, whatever that means. I continue to live and I'm an artist full-time. And um, yeah, I'm stoked to be here with you all, an esteemed company and uh, excited to hear all the um, thoughts and philosophies and ideas and dreams and uh, voila. Well, thanks for, for saying that, you know, they are coming, the thoughts, the dreams, the philosophies, it's all coming. And uh, yeah. we're gonna to go to Emily next, Emily. What would you like to say just to, as a, a little hello to our audience, just kind of backing up your, your wonderful biography, how would you like to introduce yourself and just kind of break the own, your own proverbial ice? I'd just like to say I'm really happy to be here. I admire the artists that are on the panel. I hope to hear from people that are listening to um, uh, within this uh, Zoom meeting. And yeah, the, that was the long bio and that uh, pretty much sums it up. But uh, yeah, I've been doing art since a young age because my parents were hippies and we didn't have a television so uh, there was not a lot to do and if you said you were bored then they'd find something for you to do so you never <laughs> went around saying you were bored so we listened to a lot of records and uh, did a lot of reading and a lot of writing and that was my introduction to it and now I just keep trying to get back to that because there's so many distractions in life I just want to go live in a cabin like an old wood witch and just write and make songs and listen to music is what I yeah, that's my I, that's my dream if anybody find, wants to know about dreams I find adulting gets in the way of arting so yeah I do understand trying to get back to what it is that keeps you feeling artistic keeps you fueled and passionate mm -hmm. and uh now we move on to you Eugene you want to bring us from the the past of that bio into the future the present and let us know what you're all about right now how are things oh, going where are oh, you yeah Thanks, uh, Wakefield, and uh, it's nice to be here in the company of Emily and Carl and everybody else. I'm quite honored to be asked to do this. Uh, that's kind of an old bio. I don't know what uh, where you got that. Like, but, Off your website. Uh, oh, <laughs> I need to update all that stuff. Um, but the, I think the one thing, especially with Carl here and, and maybe some other visual artists, that, that my current project um, has been kind of a lifesaver for me during that uh, pandemic, and it was a, a commission to to write a play about the Canadian-born American artist uh, Agnes Martin, and I'm working on that with Theatre Network in Edmonton. Uh, and you may know that their theater burned down to the ground seven years ago, and they've just um, this weekend finally opened this beautiful new uh, facility up in in Edmonton. So uh, I'm not sure there's so many people who haven't even heard of Agnes Martin and she's kind of a, a hero of mine. So that's been my labor of love and hopefully that's going to open in November up in Edmonton, we'll see. So that would bring you up to date a little bit on, on what I've been up to. Well, let's just move into some of the questions that we have here and see if we can uh, take some discussion from them. And I think I'll just start with Emily. So you gave us a little bit of the evolution and the evolution is music's always been there and it would be a pleasure or punishment, who knows, but music always been there for you. So what is the very beginnings of how words start to merge with music? There's songwriting and then there's putting the words to it as that poetic and lyrical element. So I'd like to know when was that evolution also something present with your music with your musical journey so like i said you know we had a lot of time on our hands on the old farm where i grew up and so um music was a part of the family we would sit around and sing uh songs mostly old folk songs just because my parents were folkies and uh so then um comes a time to branch off to your your own uh, musical tastes and so you know when I was probably about 10 or 11 I started strumming the guitar and and playing those old uh, folk tunes and as you go into adolescence maybe you start uh, playing in order to uh, deal with what you're processing around you and it just builds with you as a human uh, to be alongside of you the whole way and then 
Um, so I think that the words started coming in when I started writing my own songs. So you're moving from playing the music that is traditional or the music that you love, and then you're starting to create your own. And once that starts happening, I feel like it opens like a door to a world that some people have opened and some people might not have opened. It, it was, it pretty, it blew my mind to be able to, not in an egotistical way, but in a playful way to be able to, to create um, your own piece of work or, or something or just or just make something and and uh, just flow through that process so the words were important for that in songwriting because um, it's a part of it I mean there's emotion within the chord structure and within the sounds but the words are are the story that you're trying to tell or a part of the story you're trying to tell that is that is a very fortunate thing as well to be able to have both of those things kind of go kaboom together yeah, because I true. started music at six and didn't reach lyrics to 16. So there mm -hmm. was a whole decade of nothing connected or seemingly until a decade later. So I, I wonder what would have happened if I had started words at the same time I started with music. Mm -hmm. And I ask you, Carl, well, you make words visible in a very unique way, in a multimedia way, and you've got to explain this to people, what you do and how words entered what most people may simply see as a visual artist's world. Yeah, I, uh, I was born in England and I had the fortune of my grandparents um, taking me to the British Museum when I was very young and really showed me this kind of... Um, trajectory through human history of how consciousness, how uh, community, how um, the evolution of the human being occurred through the arts. Was, you know, the, uh, the, the fact the British took whatever they felt like taking um, allows there to be a lot of uh, human history in one building. And so I saw that very early on and I had this strong British kind of upbringing that was very classical. Um, my parents too were hippies and we moved to Canada and they uh, didn't put me in grade one. Instead, we stayed home and listened to the Beatles and did yoga and drank coffee. And um, I looked out the window at other children going to school and wondered what they were doing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And it was okay, you know, because I, I that kind of began my life of thinking and um, watching. I then kind of got into punk rock and skateboarding, and it caused me to look at the British Empire in a very different way. And I started to look at street art, and I started to look at graffiti, and I started to look at uh, protest art, and I started to look at the other view of something like the British Empire. And... Um, there was a kill your heroes kind of moment, you know, where I had to kind of um, slay the king that I looked up to. And uh, that took me then into art school and I went into visual communications rather than the fine arts because I wanted to uh, acquire as many skills as I could. But visual communication was the key because I realized that I was visually communicating the word, language, street art, graffiti, tags, I could see a correlation between logo design and signage and this kind of form and meaning of the word. And so the word started to become a part of my visual iconography. And I started to think of the word as I would a brushstroke. I started to think of letter forms that I'd seen in the British Museum, dating from cuneiform through Hebrew, through uh, gothic language into modern uh, graffiti and I could see this kind of commonality and um, you know as a, as a painter we um, are at once trapped by the weight of history of painting as it's been declared painting is dead um, because it's run its circle it's completed itself in many ways academically um, so we have to be aware of where we've come from so that we can understand it and take it apart and re-envision it. And language for me exists in that space as you know, I've always been an avid reader and a um, 
taking a typographical course in visual communications caused me to start looking at the form of letters, the shape of a serif font, you know. I famously had a, a, a typography course where I had to hand letter Caslon 540 with French curves and ink, you know, and if you do that for eight months, you get very in tune with a letter and how it feels. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it started to integrate into my art. And um, for fear of rambling further, I'll step out. However, I do need to ask you something. You mentioned graffiti. Please, yeah. So graffiti, yeah, that's the text art of my people. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember where you first, it might be hard to remember. Where no, you first I remember were well. Yeah. Impacted by graffiti. Do you remember where that was? 100%. Um, I mean, I saw it as a very young boy in England. I mean, it was like the 70s. It was like, I'm from the north of England. It was very blue collar. It was, uh, you know, Thatcherism. You had, um, it was protest really is what it was. And it wasn't the aesthetic forms that uh, emerged out of uh, New York and Los Angeles. But it was, it was a voice for people that didn't have a voice. You know, it was a way to speak out. And I got that, I heard it. Like, it's like, you know, it's, it's someone trying to be heard and it's all any of us are doing, you know? I so um, appreciate it. You mentioned ancient texts and then you mentioned graffiti. Yeah. You put it in the same place. It, it's Dude, there very... are graffiti dates to the Roman empire and there are scratchings in the columns that are literally like, fuck the Caesar. Sorry, pardon my English. But, you know, it was like all the way back there was people were just like not happy, couldn't speak out in a public forum. So they would do it in whatever way they could. And we've always done it. And uh, yeah. It, love it. Love yeah, it. You brought it. You, you made the connection for me. So thank you. Because awesome. I'm not a visual artist at all. And now we move over to you, Eugene, your, your words all over the place. The playwright, novelist, journalist, educator, poet words, 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 words. So when did the X-Men gene explode inside of you and you take this, this miracle journey? When did it begin for you? I, I feel like a, an Apollonian that's gone into the pit of Dionysus here. Um, my, my parents are so straight, you know? Uh, they weren't hippies at all. And they were, <laughs> they, my dad wore a tie to cut the lawn, you know? Uh, honestly, I've got pictures of it. Um, but I think, and there was, we got some earlier questions, right? And I was answering them and then well, I threw them all out and got the new questions. But there was a question that was answered and I'm going to be uh, really personal here about my beginning uh, of, of what I think of uh, as being an artist and seeing the world in a different way. And it happened when I was 11 years old and my older brother died, like really tragically in a way that really kind of destroyed my parents in a lot of ways. I don't think they ever really recovered. And my reality changed so much, you know? I, I, I stopped being engaged, um, non-thinking sort of in the activities of my life, which at that time were a lot of sports and um, baseball and basketball and stuff like that. And, and I started to feel myself being outside of that and, and kind of evaluating it in a way that I never had. And I didn't know how to deal with that. And so I turned to music um, and I started off as a musician, but it was classical music, okay? It, it was not the folksy thing. Um, and it was, certainly wasn't the music of my parents, which was <laughs> Ray Conniff and the singers and 101 strings and crap like that. Uh, but it was high arch classical you know, Beethoven, Brahms, all that type of uh, the classical repertoire. And that led me somehow into um, studying with a, a, a very well-known pianist. If you know the, the world of pianists, he, uh, there was a famous um, piano player and teacher in Paris named Alfred Courtauld. And my teacher in Regina, uh, whose name was Tom Mansart, was Courtauld's last pupil in Paris and he somehow met you know who knows why I lived ended up in Regina on faculty at the University of Regina and one of the things that I remember is 
I would go to his apartment and we would drink Perinol. <laughs> Have you ever had Perinol? It, it's this greenish liqueur that turns white or, you know, when you add water, it's a science experiment. And, uh, you know, I was just this raw bone prairie guy in this old, ultra refined um, environment. And, uh, what I started to notice was that he had a Mont Blanc fountain pen. I, I still use a fountain pen to this day. And he would write notes about his life and and I would read them and I was so taken with this this strokes of this fountain pen and this beautiful notebook that he had I do it to this day I, I've journaled since then and that was the 70s and I have these stupid journals that have followed me around all my life I think it's a document you know, document of about three million words now when I was at uh, well actually when I was only 16 and in, in the midst of all this I was invited to audition for uh, a Eugene O'Neill play called Long Day's Journey Into Night to play the part of the younger brother. <clears throat> I, I had never acted um, and it was going to be too much, but they needed someone to record the music. And the mother in the first uh, act plays a, a Chopin prelude. And in the second act, she's stoned and she plays it poorly. So I did the two versions. And I went from there to uh, my next theater experience was to, to create uh, the musical score and perform it for a Sam Shepard play called Suicide in B-flat. <coughs> Excuse me. So I, I wrote the music, composed it, and performed it. So my first two forays into the theater were musical. But there was something about the art form that I started, and I guess from the example of my, my teacher, Thomas, I started to, to really value the written word. And I thought more than play the music, I would like to write the words that people say. And that's how my evolution as a, a playwright really, really began. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm compressing 10 years into two minutes, but. You know, that's, that's, Totally okay. The compression is fine. I, I can say this about my correlation with music and with writing was there I was striving my best to become concert level European pianist and it wasn't going to happen. However, I do believe that I simply took all of my musicality and moved it over into yeah. my poetry. I was just able to make that shift over, bring yeah. music over to voice to bolster what it is that I do with the mic. Yeah, you the know, Wakefield, yeah, don't mean to interrupt, but Thomas said to me one thing that changed my life, and he, it's so simple. He just said to me one night, art is a way of life. And that's, if that's what you want. And I thought, it doesn't matter whether I'm playing the piano or if I'm um, writing a play or what, whatever it is I do, uh, it's it's a way of life for me, and that's that's how I live, right? Now you uh, and it's, you... it's not a conscious choice; it, it just is what's happening to you. And I'm sure Carl and Emily feel the same way, and a lot of other people in this room. We approach the world not a, we call and in the theater. I'm not sure what it's like in other art forms, but we really make the distinction between ourselves and what we call civilians, right? And either you're in and your art is a way of life and you're an artist or you're not in. And a lot of people would like to be in and pretend they're in, but they're not in. That you're, it's not a, a status thing or anything like that. It's, it's just a way of life. It's, it's how you live your life and it's different than anyone else. Well, staying with you for a second and then going to our other guests, you spoke about that journaling and you, you said you have probably a three million word document by now. So yeah, yeah. people <laughs> want to, right you know, well, people often ask, what is your regimen when it comes to writing? Do you have one? Are you writing all the time? Do you make sure you put in X amount of words, X amount of time each day? Do you have a process like that? Uh, are, are we still on me? Yes, no, okay. going back the other way. Because you brought up the journaling, so I yeah. think I'll just well, go that way. Sure, it, it happens every day, and I get kind of nervous if I haven't, you know, and it's not that I'm saying anything very profound, and it's not the same as if I have a project. Um, the, the best, I don't really have a, you know, eight to four, eight to, right, eight to four. I, I would last about 15 minutes, you know. 
But there was one time in my life when I noticed that I did have a, a process and it was me paying attention to, to what, how my mind was working. And it was when I, my novel, The Piano Teacher, I would handwritten it. There's 50,000 handwritten words in pencil of all things. And I was lucky enough to get an AFA grant to, to turn that into a typed version, you know, uh, word processed. And I, so I had the summer to, to do this. And then I was screwing around and I wasn't getting anything done. I was like, yeah, come on, you got to get this done. And so I started to realize that what I, I don't like to do that in the morning. It involves sitting at your computer, which I never like to. I like to ride my bike in the morning. So I would ride my bike in the morning. And this is the first person account of a, a piano player, right? So then I would come home and have lunch and then I needed a nap. Then I would get up and I'd play the piano for an hour to try to get my head inside his head. My char character is very close to me. And then I would sit down and I would write for a couple hours and I very, very uh, disciplined fashion wrote 500, typed 500 words a day. It didn't matter if I had to sit there till 10 o'clock at night, I, I would write 500. And if I hadn't, I consider myself a real colossal failure and, you know, go to bed sad. So, so that was the only time in my life I noticed that I had a, a, a regimen. Is that what you call it? Like a schedule, but it just, it, it emerged organically and I paid attention to it. I thought, okay, this seems to be working. So let's go with it. And it worked. That's all right. But I, I wouldn't I, impose I, that on anyone else in, in a million years. Right. It's, it's, it's very like individual. It's, it, it's like a diet. You can't impose yeah. a diet on right, the right, entire exactly. world and expect everyone. So diet-wise, Emily, how do yeah. you parcel out your meals of lyricism? Do you seem to have words and then music comes or music then words come? Do they come simultaneously? What is your regimen when it comes to putting words out there artistically with or without music? Well, uh, I feel like you know, you ever see those speakers talk and they, they're a famous writer or a famous, uh, you know, screen writer or whatever. And they'll say, oh, I get up at five o'clock in the morning and I go for a walk and then I write for three hours. And I just always wanted to be that person. Like I always wanted to get up at five o'clock in the morning and write. And I just can't because I'm not a morning person. So what ends up happening is I'm, I'm lucky though that writing is a compulsive for me. Like I don't get a lot of um, writer's block. Uh, sometimes if I'm trying to finish a song, it'll, it'll come because there's a stress or there's, you know, I'm editing myself too much or something. But generally the words come and if I don't write, I start feeling sick. So um, it ends up happening is that, you know, running around playing music all the time and doing all the business part of music, I'll get that done in the day. And my writing usually comes at nighttime. But if I can, you know, it, there'll be times if I can have a full day, I'll, I'll write a lot, like write in the morning and, and uh, write in the afternoon. If there's a day that doesn't happen, I don't feel too bad about it. You know, I can have that uh, pressure of feeling like a loser of, about it. But generally, uh, I, I'll write. I'm not saying it's all good, but the words are hitting the page. And that is important because, you know, that's where some of the gems come from. When it comes to matching the, the words and music, that's, um, that just depends. You know, if I am feeling a little blocked, I'll pick up the guitar and there's times where, you know, I get motivated by visual art or by hearing other musicians or reading. So sometimes it, if it comes, you've got to grab that and sit with the guitar and there's times where it, a whole song will just pour out. But, you know, sometimes the lyrics comes first and that, you know, you're writing it all down and other times it's the feeling of the, the chord changes that come first. Now, how about your catalog? Would you say you have more music, like right this second, would you say you have more music lined up without lyrics or do you have a bunch of lyrics that are waiting for music? Where are you at right now with each of those baskets? I feel like they're pretty 50-50. Now it's just about sitting down and trying to match it. And that's the hard part because they don't always match, you know, and, and some of the written stuff isn't in lyric form because you're trying to get a whole story, maybe, maybe you're trying to get a whole story or a concept into 16 lines. If you're trying, if you're doing, you know, a three and a half minute song, depends what you're trying to do. So, so yeah, I, I feel, and sometimes that's probably what, that's where I get um, the sticky spot is matching it up. Okay, that's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure anyone else out there who is a singer songwriter understands that concept of, I have enough for both. 
and they still don't quite line up. Yeah. And then you have that left over and you never throw anything away, correct? Oh, no. Yeah, that's it's all around me <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> it's a given. And, yeah. and then you see, I understand Eugene's world. I understand Emily's world with words. They're closer to mine. And then there's you, Carl taking words and mixing them with visions and making me feel weirdo. crazy when I see that. Yeah, man, you just wrecking <laughs> the great curve. So you've got to try and help me see how words work with you when it comes to, I guess, kind of the same questions, but when I see them in these different mediums, I don't know if they really apply the same way. How do you work with your catalog of words that need to be applied to paintings. I think I saw in the virtual tour, there was that, that one exhibition with, it was in a triangle and it came to you to write. And you said it flowed out at once. It's not yeah. as if you had a journal, you freestyled it. Yeah, and 100%. there it went, you got to talk about that. Yeah, so I realized not so many years ago that I probably have a mild form of something called synesthesia. So synesthesia is when there's kind of a uh, crisscrossing of the brain wiring and, you know, in, in extreme examples, people see numbers as color, they hear uh, smells, you know, there's just this kind of little there's bit. Of a, there's a famous book, The Man Who Tasted Shapes. Oh yeah, cool. There's a famous book, The I gotta Man get Who Tasted that. Shapes, yeah. and it's about synesthesia. Thank so you. I made, oh, I made these paintings and I would think of them in terms of sounds. And I would think like, oh, I need to bring in some, you know, some, you know, some high strings here. I need some bass is how I would think of the images. And I would talk to other painters like this and they're like, uh, it's not how I see it. And I was like, uh, you don't? <laughs> and I started to kind of dig deeper into this. And my sketchbooks over the years had kind of merged into pure text. Like you say, freestyle. I mean, I... I really connect with you and the stuff that you do because I just sit and it just flows out of me like almost extemporaneously, you know, it's um, as I'm painting words emerge and I'll off, I started out scratching into the wet paint. I would scratch in these words and it was, it was at once a nod to the street artist that I'd seen this kind of this precious special thing from the museums I wanted to scratch into because I was questioning the preciousness of it. I was questioning the, uh, the validity of, you know, high art and this um, special thing. And I wanted to kind of mark it. But then I started to connect more and more with the words. And I realized that these words actually were, had meaning, they had value. They weren't just form. They were also meaning. I'm a, I'm a student of philosophy and Heidegger um, is a big influence on me. And Heidegger believes that language is the house of being. That's where human beings emerge is through language. So I, I realized that these images were language. Color was a word. Uh, a word was a sound. So this, this synesthetic kind of um, under, uh, underlying kind of uh, methodology allowed me to not be trapped by, oh, I'm writing a poem, oh, I'm painting a picture. It was just like, I'm just making a thing and it needs a bit of red and it needs six lines of verse and it needs some symbols. And I end up with what I end up with, you know. Um, I've always felt that the known imposes constraints on creativity. Anything we know blocks off something that could be. You know, I say I'm a visual artist. Oh, well, now I can't, you know, I can't make music or I can't write words. So it's, it's very limiting when we start to define anything. So I just kind of... You know, we were talking about flow in the green room and uh, I just try to join the flow, man. I just let it come out and I try to get out of the way and whatever it wants to be, you know. 
I don't know if I answered your question, if I was just rambling in colors. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> that's totally okay. Because <laughs> we honestly, we want to hear what artists think and feel. And you can't always linear in a linear fashion say how you feel. But you did mention one thing, and that was speaking to other painters, other artists, visual artists, yeah. when you were saying to them, when you're asking or conversing with them about this synesthetic, synesthetic relationship you're having yeah. with visuals and sound and sound as a color, I'm writing hi-hats, yeah. I'm writing strings, and they're looking at you like you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. So how is it? when it looks can you collaborate well with people because other artists does not play well with others no i 100 percent, dude i like i love it man i love collaboration uh a number of years ago i had the good fortune of working on a project called body of three that was three musicians three dancers and three visual artists and we all began at a residency at the Banff springs you know and we all got in the room and dancers are warming up and the musicians are tuning their instruments and these three visual artists were kind of like you know like what do we do like <laughs> you know it's like so foreign to be in this collective kind of creative space and yet it was the most amazing um experience in my creative um career it, it just shifted everything how i work you know like in this kind of living flowing organic way as opposed to I had an engineer came in my studio years ago and he said you know you artists he's like you think you're so creative he's like you sit down in your little chair in front of your easel with your five colors and your little square canvas and you do the same thing over and over and i was just like oh like ah oh, you got me man and so, you know, I, I was always enamored of um, music and dance and poetry, this kind of living, flowing um, art forms. And so I, I was always in pursuit of that. And then I kind of realized it was right there in front of me if I just got out of my way. I love that. Get out of your own way. Love it yeah. because I'm in mine a lot. And yeah, that can really cramp creativity. You have, of course, a very unique way of using multimedia with words. And when I look at Emily as a uh, songwriter, singer songwriter, I understand that very intimately because it's something I've done. But I've done a lot of different kinds of collaborations over my time as a musician because I was a vocalist and a rapper and a musician. How has your collaborative career been for you, Emily? Has it been something that you really thrive with as a like left and right? It's it's part of you, it's part of the machine, or is it something that you kind of do as it comes, as opportunities, you know, come to you? Do you look actively to collaborate or do you just welcome the the opportunities? Uh, I think that, you know. There's kind of two parts. There's like performing or playing or rehearsing or creating with a group, which I've done with many groups. Like there's a, the House Doctors way back in the day and uh, Magnolia Buckskin and June Gloom. There's been a, a lot of projects I've been a part of when you are collaborating and working as a team. And I do love that. Like I did to have a, um, you know, play sports as a kid. And <laughs> I, I like that part of connecting with people and being a team player and for a common good. And, um, you know, listening to each other and and celebrating the differences that each of us bring to the table when it comes to creating a musical piece. So I do love that a lot. And growing up in a big family, we played together musically, and so I was used to it. And I feel like I play well with others <laughs> for the most part. Um, have you, then, collab well, have you yep. collaborated with many other disciplines other than musical? Have you found yourself as a musician with a dancer? With a, have you found yourself in that kind of multidisciplinary? No, that's group? something that I'm searching for. And, uh, you know, there's a couple people that we have on each other's radar and we keep bugging each other to collaborate together. And I, I can't wait uh, for that. Uh, one thing that we did, there was this one uh, exercise we did where um, an artist would show up with a painting and then we would write a song to it and then we'd switch roles. 
uh, I really I really loved that. That was really really interesting to do. It, it was done out of High River, and uh, so that was a, a fun project. But I did want to say though, when it comes to writing, it's a little bit different because, you know, writing is kind of a solo uh, thing, generally. But with music, there are co-writes, and so I am uh, doing both. And I I I like to co-write, but I also like to write in solitude. And I think. Uh, I've seen some people that start co-writing and it, it's like, it's, what it, what drives you? What's your purpose? Why are you writing the song? And a lot of people know that with a co-write, you can get more push for the song and and that's what they do in Nashville and the co-write, the co-write, and then they just get into this cog and all they're doing is co-writing and, you know, is it good? Is what you're doing good? Or, or are you caught up in what you think is going to get you success? And so I think it's really important um, to recognize that and also some people start co-writing and then they lose their legs alone so when they get back to themselves then all of a sudden they're not as confident and so, so it's a, co-writing as a formula for advancement is kind of cutting yeah. yourself off with creativity sooner or later in some cases yeah that's uh, right okay. and it's like oh we did a co-write and so it's also it's, it's almost like that the 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 goal is the co-write and that's to, to ch that's checked off the box. Oh yeah, I did 10 last week, you know? Yeah, but was it inspiring? Was it good? Was it, you know, different? Were you creating art or were you just doing emotion? Anyway, that's that's sounds what I think like, about the collaboration part. Oh, that, that sounds a little like Tin Pan Alley kind of syndrome as well with uh, just cranking them out because it's formula. And mm. then you start asking, where's the credibility of creativity there? And then I move over to you, Eugene. I move over to you because we're looking at the collaborative aspects and your playwright and you're, you're around all kinds of different avenues where you could probably co-curate, co-curate, collaborate with others who want to put pen to paper. But what have been the most notable experiences that you've had in collaboration? Good, bad, mediocre? Yeah, you know, well, highlights, <clears throat> right. Highlights. So when you write plays, you, you are, um, you're saying by writing in that medium that you want to collaborate, that if, if you can't do that, then you're in the wrong, wrong medium entirely. It's a collaborative art form. Um, what I find, um, if there are young or aspiring playwrights out there, I would say, the most important thing that you can ever find is a, a director who understands your work and will and will champion it, you know. And it really helps if they have their own theater company too. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of people in the bar who offer to do that for you, but it's it's only going to go so far. And I was really lucky to have some great directors um, in my life. I had Bob White here at ATP, and I've got Bradley Moss up in in Edmonton. Um, but one of the things I didn't mention, and I, and I kind of talked about how I came into theater through music, and one of the things I've tried to do, um, and let's say of my work, maybe at least seven or eight um, of my plays have had live music uh, performed um, as part of the, the, the play, as part of the, the, the production. And so what I found, and this, I think I can kind of include Carl's world and Emily's world in what we're doing in Edmonton. So Agnes Martin, that, that's the, I, I'm calling that play The Innocence of Trees, which is something that Agnes said uh, once upon a time. Um, so when we wrote, when I, we see, I, I do say when we wrote, when I wrote my play Queen Lear 10 years ago, I wanted a cellist on stage and I ran into and met Maura Ignorthy. Some of you may know her. She's just like, she's a genius of improv and she's such a presence, right? And Joyce was 80 years old and I needed someone, I needed something to be happening on stage that would take the heat off Joyce because she was old and frail and her memory was going and you know it couldn't just be her for for 70 minutes there's no way so more came in and she she based a kind of improvisational uh, score on the Bach cello suites 
and it was um, worth the price of admission just to hear more egg, but then, you know, you had everything else going. So when I started the Agnes project, I asked her to, to come along. In fact, we were in Taos, New Mexico together where Agnes uh, passed away um, and uh, where seven of her amazing paintings are in this gallery called the Harwood Gallery or Harwood Museum. So I asked her to take part in this. So the other thing with, with the Agnes play is obviously we're, I'm writing a play about a visual artist, about a painter. And so I had a very unusual circumstance. Normally I have to write quite a few drafts to make it look like it's about anything or anything, something anyone would want to see. But I had written this draft and I was, you know, it's it going good, the pandemic, man, I've had lots of time. To, <laughs> there, there's absolutely no excuse that you can say I haven't had time. And uh, so we got to this brand new theater, we're in the rehearsal hall and I'm saying, well, a projection of, um, of a ocean wave coming up on the sand would be nice here and then receding. And then over here, I like to see a train crawling across the Saskatchewan landscape. And over here, I want something that looks like her painting the tree. And, and so we're talking multi-screens. We got more egg playing and we have our, our uh, and the two uh, characters are old Agnes and a younger version of herself. Uh, so these two actresses, if I can use that term, <laughs> two uh, performers on stage, uh, and it's it be, it's becoming a real kind of three ring circus. But it, it's not a busy play, but it's there's a lot of tech involved, right? So it was the only time in my life I, I came out of a, a first read through of a play like that where everybody else had way more homework than I did. I, I had kind of written the script, right? But more I hadn't really started to put the music together. The design team and the director hadn't really, you know, had a chance to look at what I wanted in terms of projection. It's a brand new theater. So I don't even know if they know what they can do in flying, um, you know, uh, screens down from the, the fly tower or what if there's a scrim in behind. Uh, it's a total... Uh, it's a schmozzle, but I love that. I love that everybody walked away from there going, what the fuck are we going to do here? <laughs> like how, but we could see what we want, pardon my language, we could see what we wanted to do, but it, it's, it's, and it's a wonderful challenge. You know, it's not just saying to a, a designer, just pop this painting up for seven minutes here on this screen. They don't even know if they have a screen there. We don't know if we have the rights to the painting. You know, there's so much going on. And then whatever Morag's doing. So I just love that. I mean, it's a collaboration, but it's not this thing where everybody walked in with their briefcase and took out their notes and say, okay, but we, we don't know. And, and I love that, you know, and, and if, it, if it fails, I don't care, but we're at least going to try to, to show uh, and the life of an artist or part of the life of an artist who I firmly believe is one of the greatest artists ever to be born in Canada. And that's, that's my goal. And inside of this production and collaboration, look at all of the many moving parts. Yeah, so yeah, we have spoken yeah. of working in a solitary aspect simply because it's how you work. We're looking at collaborative projects. Yeah. Now let's move into a different zone where it's oh. kind of both. And that I'm going to start with Emily this time. For sure. Emily, how was your everything career creative output how was your life as an artist during the pandemic those two years where it was intensely messed up feeling and we're not coming out and we're not going in in the throes of it how did songwriting music creativity how was your life like that during that time well, I think, you know, everybody knew it was difficult, but it was, you know, I did say that I don't have writer's block, but I did put my guitar down for a while at the beginning. I felt a little bit weird singing about or, you know, writing about myself or feelings when there was so much uncertainty and people were not doing well because of a virus that was <laughs> plaguing the world. So there was a time where I was a little stunted, for sure. And I think, though, even I'm an introvert. I can be alone for days before I want to talk to somebody. I love people, 
but I enjoy being by myself. I do think, though, that as artists, and I don't want to speak for all artists, but as artists and as people, you know, I think we function within a community, even though we're not always, you know, with that community. And so when you're separated from your peers, uh, I think that can be really, really difficult. So I tapped into the online world and then that was able to kickstart me into feeling a part of a community again. And I was able to do things, you know, sh shows online, which were weird, but we, we got kind of used to it. But the Zoom, like uh, doing a Zoom, I did a songwriting residency uh, held out in Montreal because I grew up in rurally, but I lived in Montreal for a while. And I'd, I went to the BAMP Centre as well, and we did a songwriting residency and hooked up with um, Howard Billerman, who was a producer out of Montreal. And so he w started running online songwriting residencies. And so once I started tapping into my colleagues and peers across the country, and, you know, we weren't writing on Zoom every day, it was just kind of check-ins, then I felt like a little bit more normal, a little bit more like my artist self, and was able to produce um, more work. So, oh, and, you're on, you're on. Yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> and once you caught your feet again, or caught your strings again, or caught the keys again, whatever it was, whatever analogy you want to use, mm -hmm. once you, was it just kind of smooth? You found a flow and you just went with it? And, yep. It was, was like it? a new, it was a different world. It was like, okay, this is the world that it is now. If I'm feeling like I'm detached from my community, then I'll just you tap into, uh, you know, there's a, a group of us across Canada and was just send a note out. Does anybody want to connect tonight? And uh, just Zoom and maybe share a song and, uh, you know, support each other's stuff online. And then, you know, there was parts where we were able to open and do a show and then we would kind of shut down again. So, um, yeah, that's that. Residency was what uh, got me going for sure. I think, is he frozen? Did we lose him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We might have lost him. Well, what about um, since we, yeah, we did lose him. So what about uh, Carl or Eugene? The question was about, you know, how we did with our art through, um, through the, the pandemic. Yeah, um, you know, uh, for a visual artist, making art is largely monastic. I mean, you really, you know, that Banff Center uh, story I told was problematic for the visual artists because we're not used to working in collectives or groups. We're used to being alone for months on end in our little cave, you know, contemplating blue. So it, you know, if, if anything, it was like, oh, just work, you know. Um, but I, I, I also have spent um, my life, um, you know, those early years of not going to school and doing yoga, um, also involved a lot of meditation. And I continue that to this day. And um, I, I really am always in, in the inquiry of what reality even is. You know, um, life just simply ebbs and flows and um, things occur. We're in a constant state of flux. You know, uh, Heidegger, again, he, he speaks about uh, suffering. Suffering only occurs when we believe something should be other than it is. So a lot of the suffering that occurred during the pandemic was that people were like, no, I'm supposed to be able to go to a restaurant. No, I'm supposed to be able to A, B, and C. And it was like, you know, this is just what we have to do right now for the, the good of humanity. I mean, this is, it's, it doesn't mean anything. It's not mad at anyone. It's just what it is. And, you know, I kind of maintain that uh, view of life that um, it just is. So, you know, during the pandemic, I just painted. It was... Um, yeah, <laughs> I wish I could uh, say I was tormented, but I wasn't. I did what was asked and I painted pictures, you know. Um, Eugene, I don't know if you'd like to add yeah. anything to that. Well, that's, <laughs> I like your answer and, and, and me too. I, I, I was kind of disappointed that my life 
hardly changed. <laughs> I'm isolated anyway, and um, you know, wasn't seeing a lot of people. And um, but the one thing I would say that um, in terms of forums that I and I because I write in different forums, I thought I don't want to write a play about this because it seems at odds to have this collaborative art process about something that's so uncollaborative of, of that put us all into this isolation so i thought a novel would be the way to go and i thought i would i, I just try to not so much the content i don't think there even is content to this novel i think it's just kind of rambling observations but i thought it, i don't care the, the structures that i noticed you know that i'd always you know, that had always been there in my life seemed to be dissolving pretty rapidly. <laughs> and, um, and I can't forget, too, that at the beginning of uh, the pandemic was Trump, right, and, and lying, like willfully lying, and, and no one seeming to mind that he lied. And so the whole idea of truth seemed to be undermined at the same time as the pandemic, and China was being blamed. And no one knew the science and there's all this stuff that I, I you know i thought who cares anymore like what if my novel doesn't make sense fuck the world doesn't make any sense either so i'm just going to i'm going to try to i guess do something in form not necessarily in content and i i got so far and i kind of lost heart a bit i, I was fortunate to have the commission of that play that i started to read everything i could about agnes martin and that helped. And then I did have teaching on Zoom. So I filled my days, but I feel I feel if I can get this novel finished this summer, which I think I can, then I'll I could look back at the pandemic and say, aha, I I, I, I created something. I I beat the pandemic. No pandemic could stop me, you know. Uh yay me, but I, <laughs> I don't yeah, know. No, I, I think you're right because you know, in in historically uh pandemics and plagues and wars you know always from it emerges um great creative um ideas and changes you know because it, it's a time of almost um incubation you know of hibernation yeah. where um and it's all what we do with it yeah right i mean i think shakespeare wrote king lear during the 1606 pandemic didn't he of course the decameron you know <laughs> just it's, knocked um, it off <laughs> yeah marcus aurelius i mean he died in a plague you know it's yeah. um good times yeah well i look at it like this i found that artistically a lot of people who did well artistically was due to their an adaptation I literally love, I love the microphone. I love the stage. But as soon as live was done, I literally threw myself entirely into virtual. There was absolutely, I felt if live is gone and you don't have a presence online, you probably won't have a presence at all and not have one coming out of the pandemic. So my, my driving force behind being so busy during the pandemic was I actually had time to work on my own art. I wasn't going out and working here and doing stuff. You know, I was actually in the house working on everything I wanted to. I love it here. Like it turned my artistic career around, having the time to be locked down and working on what I love. So I guess there's a million stories and some of them are similar to that one. Um, let me ask this now. I'm looking at, people have been asking me, what is it that I hope I can do with my new appointment in our society with art? I would like to ask each of you what kind of major contribution you could say your art makes to the immediate society around you. I know that sounds kind of vague. However, I have to answer this question too and I have to kind of narrow it down. So I'm gonna ask, I think I'll start with Carl. I'm gonna ask you what kind of impact and contribution do you believe the unique approach you take using text in your art makes to the world around us? Well, yeah, it's an awesome question. Um, I, I think I'll speak 
at large about art. You know, I, I, I truly believe in the value of art to humanity. It's, it is a, a thing that, again, if the artist gets out of the way, because I'm a firm believer in that, right, in the dissolution of ego and just letting the art be, you know, what we react to in art, what uh, resonates with us, I honestly believe is honesty. You know, why do we still listen to Beethoven? Why do we still read King Lear? Why do, um, you know, I, I, I had an art studio in Hastings a number of years ago. And one morning I was going to the studio, Emily, I am an uh, early morning person. And I was going to the studio around 6 a.m. And there was a kid up on a rooftop and, you know, there's a lot of trouble in Hastings. So I immediately looked to see, you know, if this kid needed a help or anything. And he seemed to be up there in some kind of meditative state. And I just stood in the shadow and kind of watched him. And he was swinging his arm in this kind of circular motion. And I was like, you know, what is he doing, right? Like Tai Chi, you know? And after a couple of minutes, this kid hit a perfect circle. He painted this thing that was it was beautiful it was he was alone it was for no thing other than that moment and it was he was being completely honest in what it was he was supposed to do in that instant and he was painting what he wanted to paint and I kind of keep that with me I'm like when I sit down at the easel I'm like if I'm honest if I get the hell out of my way you know, in our college, I had a professor say to me, you explain every mark on that canvas to me. Tell me why you did that. He said, I don't want to see any art marks. I don't want to see any fluff that you're doing just to like, please mom or to get a pat on the back from your dealer or to, you know, it's got to have purpose. And if it has purpose, it'll resonate with humans. Because, you know, we meet somebody on the street, like, you know, I've met this panel tonight. And I, I, I'm connecting with each of your uh, pursuit of art and honesty and uh, belief in this thing. And it resonates with me. Like it feels good. I want to connect with you. And I think that's what we do across time. And so, you know, I think uh, in a long-winded answer to your question, because those are the only kind I know, um, I, I just try to be as honest as I can in the making of the art. And I hope that someone else connects with that and maybe gives them the freedom to be honest in their life, you know, because I think all art is trying to do is understand it. Like, what is this thing? What is this crazy ride we're on, you know? And um, yeah, we just, if we're honest, then it reflects ourselves back at us. And then it, it's done its job. You know, we're different when we leave. Uh, thank you. I like that. We're different when we leave. Emily, how do you find your music in our society doing its thing? Things that you intended it to do, things that you didn't, surprise things that happen. What, what is it all about for you? Where does your music go? And what does it do once it's there? Well, I think... Um... Coming from a traditional background, it was it was expected that if you were singing, you would sing it a certain type of way. And I always railed against that. I always thought, <clears throat> I understand, you know, what my father or his friends or people were trying to tell me now. I understand now what they mean about keeping the tradition alive. And I respect that. But I also, my whole life was trying, like saying, why can't we just do this song this way? Why can't we change it? Why can't we make it different? And so I think that my songs uh, are a, a different spin on traditional music. And I felt that was somewhat of a risk. And I feel that in taking that risk, the songs have still found their place. The other thing too is like growing up within the music industry, people tell you a lot of things. They'll tell you that... Um, you're, you know, you don't have a sound, you don't have a certain enough of a sound, you have to sound a certain way. And um, I never believed that because all my favorite songwriters like Bob Dylan or Tom Waits or whoever, 
uh, even Joni Mitchell, uh, would write a different, like, look at Buffy St. Marie, would write all different types of songs uh, for different types of genres. And so um, I feel that I, the songs that I write are, um, I'm flexible in my writing, and they're still finding their way. So it just, I feel like if you're doing your art, you need to um, continue to not listen to people and just do what the calling is. And, you know, if someone's telling you to do a certain way, you can consider it, but just do what the calling is. But really to answer your question, if the music speaks to someone and helps somebody not feel by, uh, alone in the stories that I'm telling that are my own stories and sometimes other people's stories, uh, I feel that 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 is what art is. We're supposed to affect people, even if it makes them uncomfortable. Um, I'm okay with that. But um, hopefully they're feeling uh, comfort in the songs that they're hearing or, or not feeling uh, so alone within whatever their life is dealing them. You're on mute, Wakefield. I'm sorry, I'm taking yeah. notes. And, yeah, something you said that really um, struck me. You understood how the traditionalists of the music were saying this is how it's supposed to be done. Now and, I understand. And, yeah. and how, yes, you now you respect that and you understand why they said it. However, mm -hmm. Because it's the way we've always done things is one of the worst things that have ever happened has ever happened to humanity. One of the mm -hmm. worst reasons that we keep doing things is because we've always done it that way. So I love the fact that you're saying I respect that, but it can be there is more than one way to do anything. Mm -hmm. So I, I love how you have brought that spirit to the music saying I respect the elders, but I'm one of the new jacks too, and we can do the old stuff new ways. I, I love that. So thank mm -hmm. you. It's um it's something you deal with as you get older too. You respect the older generation's take on tradition. You see how you kind of were rebellious. And then as you age, sometimes you look to hold on to traditions a little more as you go. It's a, it's a weird kind of circle, but I heard it there in your answer and thank you. And then I come to you, Eugene. I come to you. You and come I say, to me. I come to you with the same uh, <laughs> on bended knee. I'm sure <laughs> same query about where you see the impact of your work in the yeah. world around you broadly, in close peripheral. How do you see it manifesting? Where do you see it living? Well, I'll tell you something in a very very tiny microcosm of what I hope I am doing. I had a text from a woman I don't really know last night who's going through an incredibly difficult death in her life and wanted to express herself and her feelings about it but didn't feel confident and she said she admired my writing would I help her to me that there could be no greater compliment to what I'm trying to do as a as a writer and you know Carl spoke earlier about getting your ego out of the fucking way and just just letting the art happen and when, when something like that happens it's, it's to be at service for someone like that of course I, I I said yes obviously I would um so there's a a small example well it's not a small example it's huge uh in in that woman's life especially but I was thinking of um something that Joseph Campbell said, which I think I'm quoting him correctly when he said that life may be a field of sorrows, but we can approach it with joy. And I think I've approached the field of sorrows in full recognition that it is a field of sorrows, but I've approached it with humor. And I think that what I've, I've tried to, it, it, sounds, it sounds facile now, but what my first hit was a, a dysfunctional family trying to celebrate Christmas together. And I was saying to the audience, Christmas is shit. Your family, you hate them. Like, and yet you put yourself through this ordeal every year. And you know what? It's so absurd. It's funny. And people laugh their heads off in recognition of their own families, right? I'm not rubbing anybody's nose in it. I'm just saying, look, you're probably going to still be doing it the next 10 years, but at least laugh at it because it's so absurd, right? And I think I gave people in, through a lot of my work and in, in the Herald, especially, I think, look at this is a screwed up situation. It's funny though. I mean, if you're going to take everything to heart and let it weigh you down, because there's so much bullshit in the world right now, it, it's, it's going to crush you, right? But if you can laugh, I always think 
that that you can own the thing and you then you're not taking it you're taking it seriously but you've got a you got a way of dealing with it and i think more and more we need a way to i, I honestly one night i i went on cnn on my app and i thought i'm gonna I don't know what the hell's going on in the world. I'm going to look at the news. And I got three stories in. I poured the biggest vodka you've ever seen. And I just threw my phone away. I said, I can't deal with this crap. I mean, look at just, you know, it's it's unbelievable. It's 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 colossally crushing right now. So I say laugh. What the hell? That maybe, is not maybe the that's worst medicine. My, maybe that's been my contribution to help people laugh through hard times. Okay. Take it seriously too, though, right? The the hard times of life are one thing, but I've been asked this question, and there are certainly some hard things about how there have certainly been some hard moments, some hard elements in my poetic life that were hard to move forward through. There there were some things that were not easy to move through to have my career progress can you think of one thing it doesn't have to be a, a huge uh dissertation of it but is there an element that remains prominently in your mind i'll start with you emily that you can think of in your career where you go yeah th here is one hard thing in my industry that i've dealt with that you can think is unique unique enough to make Emily's and share with us? Does it have to be a, a, the industry, a something difficult within the industry, or is it something difficult we went through? Sorry. Either. Either would be fine because they can, they can kind of cross over. I think like the industry is a big machine on its own, that, mm. you know, and so there's a lot of things I could say about that, but I think the toughest uh, uh, time I had was uh, I had a concussion that laid me out on my couch for a long time and uh you know people would say oh that's really difficult for you and it was it was really hard i couldn't listen to music i didn't know if i was going to be able to play music ever again all i could do was lie on the couch and listen to audiobooks and color that was all i couldn't follow a recipe i couldn't really walk very much and so i lay there for a long time and as i was lying there i thought okay, I have two choices. I'm either going to go into the dark side or I have to find the light somehow. And so anytime I was having a hard day, I would just go towards the light, which the visual was standing under a beam of light. And so I would just did that every day and, and uh, went towards the light. And, you know, I may have done yoga before. I may have meditated before but I really needed to do yoga. I really needed to meditate in order to somewhat survive <laughs> through, through whatever that was. And so uh, I developed a different type of artistic relationship with myself. I also, you know, maybe have been working too many shifts instead of focusing on music. It was at that point that I decided that, you know, life is short because, you know, the concussion was, I got hit in the temple with a field hockey ball. And uh, that's pretty close, you know, to, that could have gone pretty sideways. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I thought, well, if I'm going to do a solo album, I, I got to do it now. What am I waiting for? And it was the impetus to starting doing my solo because I'd been in bands for a whole long time. So I think that that was something that was hard. And, and uh, it was kind of like the best thing that ever happened to me was, was that injury because it changed my course of life and really, you know, I felt like that's where I made the decision to, you know, be, to, to live the artist's life, to, to really embody it. And, and to see that the glorification of busy was embarrassing. I was embarrassed about how I was before in regards to um, being busy all the time. You know, there is something in rest and that's where creativity is born sometimes, uh, a lot of times for me. Anyway, that was long winded, but that was, that was my, that was that great. Was my story. Thank you. That was great. I um, I'm I'm really impressed at the take of this concussion because the thing that cat this concussion that catapulted you into this driving force is also the thing that could have changed your neurology to prevent you from ever being creative again. Yeah. So that is that's skating a thin thin edge. Mm -hmm. 
but thank you for mentioning that concussions are serious i've had more than one and yeah it changes yeah. your life yeah. how about you carl what would you say is one of the most yeah. major hiccups well uh, it's creative funny. concussions you've ever had yeah yeah well uh i would say um Being a career visual artist is probably the biggest uh, block I've had to being, to making art. You know, the, the, the ability, so I'm, it's not lost on me, the dance, um, music, these ephemeral kind of art forms have a harder product to create. In the visual arts, we create product. Okay. I mean, in a, in a literal sense of after I express myself, there's a thing there that I can then monetize. I can sell. Okay. That has been the biggest problem because it's very easy. And, you know, I, I saw a lecture by Evan Penny, if uh, I'm sure most people are familiar with him, uh, a sculptor, a brilliant, brilliant sculptor. And years ago, he said, um, every time I get any kind of uh, success, whether it's um, financial, critical, whether my mom pats me on the back, I hang a left. Because comfort is the most dangerous place for creativity. And so in the ability to make a thing that you can sell, you know, if you sell the thing, it's like, hmm, I could make more of those things and pay my bill. And this kind of uh, snowball effect happens and it's very dangerous because, you know, whilst I, I choose to sell my work as a means to earning a living, I am wholeheartedly in pursuit of creating art and delicate balance of the thin line that we skate, as you mentioned, um, is does art, can art hang that line of being a commodity and still being a pure expression of what it is to be of living, you know? And so it's, um, that's, that's remains to this day, the biggest challenge, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier that professor that said to me, I better be able to explain every mark on the canvas. And if I said to him that Mark's paying my NMAX bill, you know, it's uh, I'm sorry, dude, that's, uh, <laughs> that doesn't get past the art. Uh, so, you know, I, I, that conversation is in my head every day and it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a continual letting go. You know, I, I teach at the art college, or the university now from time to time. Um, I teach figure drawing and I, I don't teach them anything. There's nothing to learn. The thing to learn is to let go of what you think any of it is. That's the learning, the letting go. And so, you know, every time I kind of approach some new work or an exhibition, I let go of all the things I was before that moment and just try to let this thing emerge fresh and new and you know with the belief that you know uh as per my answer to a previous question that if i'm honest that it will resonate with humans and it will it will have success whatever that means but i will pay my bills ultimately <laughs> what that means um yeah it's uh you know it's a, it's a catch-22 it's like you know that's... You know, you're a successful artist, but then it's like, keep making that art. And it's like, well, that's not art anymore. You know, there's a, I make a strong line between production and creation. And it's so easy to slip, you know, so it's always checking oneself, right? Oh, thank you. Check that's yourself great. before you wreck yourself. Man. <laughs> uh, One of the hardest things is you can yeah, create yeah. it and then it becomes something monetized. Okay. Yeah. Then I come to you, Eugene. I would like to wrap up our major part portion of our conversation, uh, positing the same to you. 
do you have one small catalytic concussive creation <laughs> moment <laughs> in your career that you could just say hey you know this happened and um this is how i got through uh, you know not to sound uh, conceited but i don't really and and i was i was writing something um for this book i had last year that i've had plays in okay this is how ancient i am i've had plays in six decades I've, I've had plays done in six decades. I must be like 90 years old or something. Uh, but, uh, and as I did that and I lucked out like severely with, with like the ATP uh, residency and stuff like that. And then I guess I was really super tired of writing plays. I thought, fuck it. I got picked up by the Calgary Herald to write a bullshit column for six years. And so I did that. And then I got I wrote a couple more plays. I wrote that play for Joyce. I had some really cool teaching gigs. And then I wrote a novel that won an award. And now I'm writing a play that's a total labor of love. And I, I guess because I've written in different forms, because you know, Wakefield, I've done a lot of poetry in, in that time too. I, I think whenever something might have stalled me or stopped me in my tracks, I said, okay that's okay i'm gonna go do this now and i've been lucky that i can can work in different forms with uh i guess the same amount of enthusiasm do you know yeah so you've been able to just move seamlessly through different environments and seamless seamless i'm not saying that there weren't long hard looks at myself in the mirror <laughs> and, and some, some bleary mornings and going what the hell but I think that that was stuff seeping in from my personal life. I think the uh, writing and I always had a good relationship, you know, mm -hmm. and, and no matter what was going on, uh, also overarching all of that was the, um, the, the journal that I was, I was writing all through this time, right? Going back to my first one that I have is from 1972, you know, so that's always been there. So the writing, I can't say, We've never had a big fight or a big argument. Uh, it's always been good. <laughs> that's lovely. I love it. The three of you, thank you so very much. We're going to take a bio break and we're going to take five minutes. It's 8.31, which means it'll be 8.32 in no time. So I'm going to ask all of us, our guests, our panelists, if we can take, we'll, we'll call it five minutes, but we will come back at 8.37 everyone get a drink use the loo come on back and we'll have some q a with our guests before we wrap everything up 8 37 please thank you so much see you soon oh just a quick feed break then we got half an hour before And we could have our panelists ask them as they come. So anyone, would anyone like to go? And there we are. From Patricia Duquette, what would each of you say to an artist struggling, feeling blocked or lost in their work with words? Who would like to pick that one up first? Carl, Emily, or Eugene? I'll take it. You hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You want me to go? Oh, yes, please go right yeah. ahead. Thank you. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, this writer's block is an illusion. It's not real. 
it's like it's this kind of listening that we have that um, allows us to not dig deeper. So we go, oh, I blocked or oh, I can't do that. And it's like it's, it's completely made up. All one has to do is just start. You know, like it, it, it it's funny, like I, um, I sat in a workshop once with a lady that was um, wanting to paint. She couldn't move. She was like frozen. She had no ideas. She didn't know what to do. And she had a cup of coffee sitting by her. She was a watercolorist. So like watercolors are very, very structured, how they work. Everything's very precise. And I walked past her and I knocked her coffee over on her pad of lovely paper, you know. And she jumped up and she was mad at me. And uh, there was this big commotion in the studio. And, you know, I was like, just sit down and let's just look, you know. And the coffee had started to spill and it started to make marks and it was dripping over the table. And this beautiful organic thing had begun. And then I got her to dip a little bit of her color into the coffee that was liquid. And that started to change the stain. And that's all it took was an act of movement, you know, like this kind of this step into being. And so I think um, if you're feeling something like a block, just begin, just write a word and see what word comes next. And that's all it is. It's like, you know, if you want to meet somebody, just step up to them and say hello. It's very simple. Humans complicate through the simplicity of life. Just begin. <laughs> Love that. Um, what I would like to do is make sure that I remind everyone to complete the feedback form. The link is in the chat. We'd really appreciate it if we got that feedback from you. If you could take a few minutes to fill it out, please do. It's halfway up the link. I see it halfway up the chat. And there it is again. Thank you, Rachel. Um, do we have any other burning questions to ask any of our artists? Let's see. There, there aren't any other no. uh, questions that, that came up. Um, I've been watching from the beginning and it's interesting there were no questions, but there were some comments that I wrote down that people made that I thought could, could trigger um, some interesting additional discussion. So, we could bring some of those up. Um, there is a question from Patricia, but uh, let's see, let's look at this first. Um, Patrick Close mentioned towards the beginning, he said, I am troubled by the parallel river of words which we are forced to drag along with us as artists. The artist statement, Curators, critics, adjudicators, reviewers, funders seem to value written theoretical contexts of artworks more than the work itself and to judge us by these statements, not by the work. The direct experience of a, of a creative work appears to be displaced by these parallel words. Oh, sorry, I was gonna make this, I was gonna share this screen. Hang on a second, there. Can you see this? There. There, I just wondered if anybody would like to address that at all. I, I could say something, I guess. <clears throat> um, I, I, <laughs> I, I came up through an academic system, right? Doing a master's, two master's degrees. And I was very much in the, in the world of the university and, and where such madness is allowed to flourish and people actually get paid for creating it. And um, I think you just, if you are a working artist, you just simply ignore it. At, at least I do, uh, maybe to my per peril. Uh, and I, when I think of uh, art, or maybe Chris would comment on this, but I think of Tom Wolfe's book, The Painted Word, uh, about abstract expressionism. It's hilarious, right? It just shows the, um, the madness of how, how far it came and how far it, it, it superseded in importance, really, the work of art itself. And that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, I think Buddy. it's really easy Thank to you. to be distracted by what uh, people are saying or writing about the work that is being done. 
And um, I think that the most important thing when it comes to the music uh, industry is exactly what Eugene said, is just ignore it and, and keep going and keep playing. Because, you know, one person might say one thing and another person might think something completely different. And if you're just waiting for good reviews and you're halted by maybe a not so good review, then <clears throat> you'll never get to that good review if you're if you're just halted by somebody who might have, you know, not gushed over the work that you just completed. So it's just to keep going. And also, um, I don't know about the other industries, but it can be about buzz and hype. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you're not going to, you, you won't get those good reviews if you, if you stop. So I don't mm -hmm. know if that answers the question, but that's how I, I looked at it. Oh, you've answered a question. How about you, Carl? Do you have a response to this? Yeah, for sure. Thank uh, you. None of it means anything. It's um, we're ants floating on a rock in an expanse of nothingness. So it's like the fact that we kind of get caught up on, um, you know, uh, these little things is like they're just blocks. Like just, just move through them. They mean nothing. You know, it's like if someone wants you to write a statement, write a statement. Write whatever you want to write, or write it to the audience, or you know, it's, it's your dream. It's like, it's, um, it's just simply what it is, you know? Um, I think uh, if you're in pursuit of writing music or poetry or painting a picture or painting a circle on the roof of a building, then just find your way to that thing. And whatever one has to do to get to that thing, just do it. You know, if I want to run in the Boston Marathon, then I got to buy some runners and I got to, you know, um, get a water bottle. I got to do these things that will allow me to do the real thing I need to be doing. And that's kind of the way I view all that stuff. You know, it's uh, it's minutia and it's it's OK. Carl, you know, I, I had a question for you. I was wondering, please, um, yeah. did you dump that lady's coffee on her paper on purpose or was it by accident? 100% on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. When I look at Patrick's um, comment here, I, I have something to say to this too. And that is, I have not been well received all through my career. My career has been not the shortest and only now have I reached this kind of Olympian height in my, my uh, world. Uh, if I had listened to everyone that decided that a young black man on a microphone wanted to be the next rapper, I'd have been done years and years ago. If I believed everyone that said that my poetry isn't poetry, I got thrown out of York University because they said that my poetry was nonsense, garbage, gobbledygook, and out I went. If I listened to the egghead academics, if I thought it was only MLA, if I didn't push through being NYC, I wouldn't be poet laureate. So some of this is noise and some of these are hoops, but they both exist in this world of art. So you push through the hoops and you be that artist. You got to own how you're known. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. Um, wow. That's a, that's a good story, Wakefield. Thank you. Um, I have I have more comments to share if anybody wants to see more of them. So let's see, Let me go back here. Okay. Um, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. So Pat brought this up. Interesting how musicality plays a large role for all participants that music was brought up for everybody. Does anybody want to comment on that? I think there was a companion. No. I think um, um, if you look at a um, play, play script, it's to, in my mind very much like a score, a musical score. Um, it's not a, a literary work. It, it can become. Uh, <laughs> when it's sort of dead on the stage, but it's really, um, it's a cue to all the instruments of, of what they ought to be playing uh, without dictating exactly how they should be playing it. 
And um, so whatever musicality I brought uh, into those first works or as literally composing or uh, recording the music, it still exists in this idea of, of the script as a score. And that's all I have to say about that. Anybody else? I think perhaps um, music, um, it really may be the, you know, the intonation of vowels in the speaking, right? Is, is a, a vibration of the vocal cords, right? It's, it's harmonic. And Emily, I apologize for my butchering of the vocabulary of sound. I'm doing the best I can, but um, it's, you know, it, it's really maybe one of the first things we experience, the heartbeat of a mother, you know, in the womb, like it's rhythmic. It's, um, it's, it's, it's maybe so fundamental to who we are that how can it not be integral to all of our lives, you know, whether it's through artistic expression or just simply dancing in the kitchen, making dinner, you know, it's like, it's just our natural, um, it's, it's the sound of being alive is really a harmonic vibration. And, you know, I've always, like I say, been enamored of it and jealous of it as a painter. It's like, um, you know, I remember I've, I've meditated with a Buddhist monks in Tibet and Nepal. And um, there's this belief that the, the intonation of a sacred syllable like Om or something, it, it's an it's a eternal vibration to the universe that we join, you know, and if I choose to sit in a morning meditation and engage in that um, syllable, I join millions of intonations of that syllable throughout history and that reverberate through the universe, you know, and, and this is kind of music, you know, mm -hmm. it's why, you know, I see my uh, little niece dancing to the Beatles because she feels it. And how many people have danced to the Beatles, right? It's like, it's this shared human um, experience. And um, Emily, you were way better to talk on this than myself. But <laughs> no, I think you're doing great. <laughs> I'm just listening. Yeah, no, I, I would say I agree with um, all of those comments. And, and that also, you know, we were born musical. And I'm like, I'm one of those people. This isn't the last question, I hope, because I'm always mm -hmm. the one that brings it dark. No, 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 no. <laughs> and makes no. everything uncomfortable. But uh, yeah, so we we're uh, born with musical abilities and musical wants and desires. And it's socialized out of us like a lot of different arts uh, and your voice is a, a really personal thing and it's very common to criticize people's voices especially when they're singing so you know i, I i'm pleasantly surprised that music uh well uh, aff uh affirmed i guess that music was involved in in the other artists that are on this panel um because it is a part of all of us we just have to to uh, keep doing it and not worry about what other people think about it so and I think it's, it's, I think music is a part of all of our lives more than we even know. That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Next comment. Um, so interesting how everyone's genres overlap. Sound, calligraphy, and performance. That's a good observation. Any comments about that? I, I did, I'll say something about that. Um, when I was first starting, um, you know, um, being a little bit more serious about music or being serious about music and wanting to improve and continue education past, you know, post-secondary. Um, it was recommended me to take part in the um, One Yellow Rabbit Summer Intensive Lab, which is three weeks. And I kept saying, well, I'm not a performer. I'm not an actor. I don't think I would belong there. And uh, they had said, oh, no, we had a, a musician. It was uh, Anne Laurie before you. And so I applied and got accepted to it, and it was one of the best things I've ever done um, and would recommend it to anybody of any age. They, they even have one that they do that's a little bit less intensive for people that are working, uh, through, and they do it through the summer. And um, it really allowed me to understand the connection between actors and uh, musicians and how we can use a lot of the skills that are used in acting um, 
just about slowing down on stage as a musician and also there was a visual arts component it had everything it was it was pretty great so i just thought i would I'll let people know about that the program in terms of music and sound when you write comedies k sounds are always funny on stage Hey. Yeah. <laughs> it, it has impact. It has impact. It's Something true. about K words are funny. Yeah, that's funny. Okay, um, I can go on to the next one if um, if everybody's finished with that one. Okay. Come on. Clearly, I am. <laughs> okay. Um, here. Body of Three sounds amazing. Listening to your inspiring stories makes me think of you four collaborating and what possibility that holds. Patricia said, magic is possible when we come together. And then Carl said, we should create something. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I told I, you that. I like to say to people, I'm usually an, un an unusual person that they've collaborated with. So if you can hear my voice, then I can put it there. That's how I collaborate. If you can hear me, then I can put my voice there. So I'm always down to collaborate. Yeah, 100%. It, uh, you know, collaboration is so interesting across different disciplines because it challenges the very thing we do. You know, it makes us reframe it. It makes us rethink it. It, um, yeah. There's, there's. Uh, I think there's so much value to it. And uh, um, you know, as I know the night's winding down, but I'd just like to say, like, I've been honored to sit with you four and um, you three. I guess there's four of us. But um, yeah, you're all amazing, creative minds and forces and um thank you for sharing space with me and um hey say the word and i'll uh i'll paint colors <laughs> i don't know if i'm the one who's going to tie things up but i'd like to thank our three panelists for joining us our three guests and uh inviting us into their world of words and i would like to thank all of you for allowing me to moderate this uh umbrella talk for ear i would like to thank everyone who has come to um, enjoy this experience and exchange uh speak and meet with our with our guests and get a, a greater view into all of these separate worlds of words and how they're being utilized in these different capacities. My name is Wakefield Brewster. I'm a poet and spoken word artist, and I'm just really happy to be here uh, with all of you. The right amount of people were here, and everyone who was supposed to be here is here right now. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Wakefield. Cheers, Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it all. Thank you, everyone. I just want to say one thing. There was one other question. Karen Begg asked for suggestions of books. And what we could do okay. is maybe um, write down the list of the book suggestions that were made and send that list out to everybody who was here, just because we're running out of time. Okay? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for all for being here, everybody. It was awesome. Have a great evening. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night, all. Good night, guys. Thanks. Right, right.